Would you like me to ask Alma to leave? No. Why? Well, if you're going to make her a ghost, go ahead and do it, but please don't let her sit around waiting for you. I'm very fond of her. Oh, you're very fond of her, are you? <clears throat> well, in that case... No, don't turn it on me. I don't want your cloud on oh, my head. shut up, I mean, You can shut right up. Don't pick a fight with me. You certainly won't come out alive. I'll go right through you and it'll be you who ends up on the floor. Understood? And that's a clip from Phantom Thread. I'm delighted to say it's director Paul Thomas Anderson is with us. Paul, how are you, sir? Very good. How are you? How, are you de how would you describe your week so far? Uh, w w is today Thursday? Today? Friday. I'm thinking mainly of the nominations, really. That's what I was thinking. Oh. <laughs> oh. God, it felt like Tuesday to me, honestly. Um, my week's been very good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you must be... Th so, you know, best actor... It is Friday already? It is. Oh, God. Picture, supporting actress, uh, original music score, costume design, six nominations. That must give you a little spring in your step as you're walking through London streets. Yeah, for sure. Nobody seems to care on the streets, though. I keep wa I like walking around like like with a sign over my head saying, like, right, everybody? And no one seems to <laughs> they don't just not walk right past me. You're not tempted to go up to people and say, don't you know I've got six Oscar nominations? Yeah, I went to the movies last night, and I, I was hoping to be recognized in the lobby. There was, like, Phantom Thread, like, five-star reviews all the way around, and the, and the guy was like, right. Just give me your money. I don't. Yeah, I was hoping to be recognized, but it didn't. It what didn't did, go my way. I still had to pay full price for the what did ticket. You see, what did you see? I saw downsizing, and I was nuts. Terrific. I mean, really, I loved the first hour. I sort of then it just got weirder and weirder and weirder, and um, in a good way. I think in a good way. <laughs> I kind of I, I wasn't sure at the time, and then I walked out of there, and I'm really happy with the with the weirdo places that it went. It was really. And, and no one said, excuse me, are you Paul Thomas Anderson? Unfortunately okay, not. No, right. it was... Uh... Well, let's, well, let's do that talk. Let's do that, <laughs> that talk. Now, that clip that we just played uh, with Daniel Day-Lewis and Leslie Manville having, having one of their breakfasts together. Leslie Manville in incredible uh, form and basically bossing uh, that scene. Just, ex just explain a little bit about the story of this and, and, and what that scene tells us about their characters. Well, uh, we have a kind of... Um, mile markers through our film of of breakfasts with the Woodcock siblings, you know, and you can kind of measure the film by how breakfast goes. We have one early on that establishes the tone of the house. This one is about three quarters of the way through when the dutiful Cyril, Leslie, played by Leslie Manville, turns up the volume on Reynolds and, and basically you re all, all the truth comes out about her being the elder sibling who, who is really <laughs> in charge, right. you know. And if you've ever had a fight if you have a brother or a sister, if you've ever been in one of those matches, um, you know that it is as brutal as it gets to have a fight with a sibling. Like Because a sibling can say things that no one else can, and they know just how to get right at the center of what is going to cut you down or put you in place. Yeah. So, And these two have, a, have an empire. Really, yeah. Don't they? How, how would you... And, and so, uh, so he is uh, an extraordinary dressmaker. She, how would you characterize... Uh, their relationship what does she do and what does she bring she kind of runs everything really. she runs everything um but she well she spoils him you know she allows him to be a spoiled baby and that's what keeps the engine running of this of this place she probably just inherited the a relationship that he had with his mother which was basically you're the golden child who can sew who can do all this stuff you're this creative type so let me make sure your feet never touch the ground so his elder sister has carried that mantle for him and allowed him to behave in certain ways that are really, well, they're unacceptable in real life, but in the world of this theater, of this house, this couture house, they're perfectly yeah. acceptable. We're in 1950s London. Wh why is it, why did you set it here and why did you set it in that time? They're tied together because that's the heyday, you know, after the war, sort of the, what happened with Paris and London in fashion is the golden era of couture. All those, just, we still look at all these dresses today. There are museum tours about them. I mean, so like the golden age of Hollywood, that's the golden age of dressmaking. So it could have been Paris or it could have been London because those are the two epicenters. And I've always wanted to work here. I love it here. I mean, just the walk today. I couldn't explain my love for it here, but I've always wanted to work here. It gives you access to great actors as well. And you, you wrote this with Daniel Day-Lewis. Yeah. How, how does that process work do you write 
a bunch of scenes and then say, what do you think? Or does he write some scenes? How, how does that? No, that, the first. I write scenes, hand them over. I think at first it was a collection of a, of a, a lot of scenes that didn't really have a story. It was a sh pretty shapeless. And when it started to have some shape, after about like 25 or 30 pages, I showed that to Daniel, got his input which initially was sort of more silent input. I think he, as any good collaborator, he was just sort of waiting to see a little bit more of where I'd go. And probably about halfway through the story, he really started to chime in and come up with suggestions. And uh, it was a proper collaboration of going back and forth. And then we kind of worked through the end of the story together. Does he anglicize it at all? Does he say, no, I'm, like, you know, I'm English, I'm not going to say that? Yeah, like I, w I would say, um, I think Alma says, I'm mad. I thought, oh, because that's a good line, because she's mad. And he says, I think you mean angry. You know, I thought, right, okay. <laughs> okay. That's one That's one way. Ill, I think I'm going to be ill. I think I'm going to be sick. I think I, I would write, I think I'm going to throw up. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think Reynolds would say I'm going to throw up. No. <laughs> no. Um, so uh, the other woman in the movie is, of course, played by Vicky Creeps, who plays Alma, who you've just, uh, just mentioned. What is it that attracts Reynolds to Alma? What is it that attracts Reynolds to Alma? Um, what are you doing? I'm just getting <laughs> I'm getting a finger signal as to how many minutes are left. The answer is eight. Okay. <laughs> um, so I could fill a minute of silence thinking about this question. Look, Daniel Day-Lewis <laughs> can be a silent contributor. You cannot. <laughs> okay. Because um, that doesn't make great radio. <laughs> exactly. Pauses on the radio like you could drive a truck through. Mm -hmm. It's not... <laughs> Dan Daniel will get away with it, but I'm afraid you won't. Exactly. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, he sees, he sees, he sees, um, she's cute to look at. She's beautiful. Um, and that's the, the initial thing. And she stumbles and she blushes. And there's this kind of instant attraction. But very quickly, it becomes something else. It becomes um, a challenge and an and opponent. I think he's in a position where he's probably turned on by love as, as, a, as a sport, you know. I think he's probably looking for somebody to um, go against him mm -hmm. and treat the relationship as if it was a tennis match or a chess match or a wrestling match, whatever it was. And we're back to breakfast um, because he's ordering uh, a breakfast. And the way... Daniel Day-Lewis orders breakfast is a seduction scene. It, maybe it's just the way he says, and sausages. But everyone, I think there was a great line, and only he could have given it the, the power that he does. It's funny, isn't it? I remember being on the set and thinking, I can't believe how much mileage we're getting out of ordering <laughs> breakfast. Right. This, is, this is really <laughs> astonishing. <laughs> yeah. And I, just on the subject of food, which, is, which you've hinted at talking about breakfast, but food is a theme throughout the film and when he's hungry he's happy yeah and when he loses his appetite he's an angry man yes i don't want to go any further but maybe you can just add some color into that add some color to that well yeah um he clearly has a large appetite in general for everything i think what makes him a good character is that he's the kind of character that could eat a breakfast that large pr probably every single day and still be um rail thin which says a lot to mm -hmm. you you know which says a lot like how much he must be burning per square inch. As it's pretty clear the intensity that he that he has over his life and yeah. his work. You've had experience in this before, of course, very successfully. How do you direct Daniel? Do you just wind him up and let him go? How how, how does that relationship work? It's a little bit like that. It's you know a lot of the work I feel is you do beforehand. You do in in the preparation and the talking about it and the formation of the script. So much of that work happens in the year leading up to starting and once you start it becomes very minimal um, usually what the decisions that we make each day were really quite simple which is like what color bow tie to wear you know that was those were the big decisions that we would make he takes a, a ball and runs with it very strongly the most you have to direct sometimes you have to sort of you just say oh it's getting a little slow or you're rushing it or something very simple like that that's kind of the extent of direction it's all beforehand it's all that constant kind of investigation of the possibilities of the way a scene might go, the possibilities mm. of a voice or a character or how he dresses, how he eats breakfast, what he orders for breakfast, all that stuff you've, you've dealt with beforehand. And the good news is, is that you don't, once you, once you start shooting, you, can, you get on with the 
practical business of doing it. It's funny. It, it can be labored before. It's a year of very detailed work, but it's funny just how simple it is once you start shooting. It's really mm-hmm. kind of... Um, we don't... I don't think either one of us likes to belabor a scene or do it too many times, and so we try to move swiftly once we start. And when did you know that he was going to retire and that this was uh, apparently his final picture after we finished he he made his announcement how did you feel sad strange yeah uh, for sure um do you believe him i do but then again aren't announcements of retirement made so that they can be broken maybe ask elton john (laughs) oh did, did elton retire again he's got a farewell tour for three years so, is that right? Yeah. Well, he's got a lot of a lot of ground to cover. Can I mention uh, just before we finish that um, Johnny Greenwood getting a, an Oscar nomination for his score at last? Um, yeah. Because there are many people who would say he should have been here before, but you know, there's a technicality and he wasn't included for uh, for Blood. And just can you just you you must be thrilled for him, and you've worked with him many times. What is it that he brings? Well, I just want to say that almost better than Johnny getting nominated for an Oscar is the thought of Johnny in a tuxedo. (laughs) That and even yet even better than that is the thought of the possibility of him having to give an acceptance speech is is has made me so happy. Um, I mean, I would pay top dollar to have to see him get up there and have no (laughs) idea how that would go. Many people thought he should have been nominated. Yeah, he for, should have, for sure. But then there was that technicality, and, yeah. and so he, he wasn't included um, because some of the music had been heard before or something like that. But anyway, the fact that he's in there yeah. now must be enormously rewarding and satisfying to you. Uh, hugely. There's always been a kind of knock on the Academy branch saying that they're, they're a bit, there's a bit of a snobbery going on and there's, that you, they kind of look at a rock musician and think, oh, he's, not, he's faking it. And... Um, Johnny is so far from faking it. He's he's obvious, he, as you know, and a lot of people around here know. He's a proper musical course, yeah. genius, prodigy rather. So it's amazing that he's recognized, and he should be because it's a great, great score. And he worked his ass off. I mean, I mean, there's so much music in the movie. So yeah, and 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 it was and there was a bummer on There Will Be Blood. It was really a bummer. The Academy had had to deal with. A couple of years before, a score that had been utilized um, in other ways, and they, they gave it an award. So there was this kind of insane restrictions about where music had been played before. I mean, we used a portion of a of a of a piece that Johnny wrote for the uh, as a BBC commission that like five people heard, you know, and we just took that. And anyway, it's great that they recognized him this yeah. time. Uh, well, congratulations on uh, on all the nominations. Paul Thomas Anderson, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you.